Hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully, we're live. Uh, Jackie, can you see my screen? Here? I can. Yes, I can. Perfect. Uh, so I think we should just dive right in um, and get started. So uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to attend this joint uh, project community meeting and EIR comment meeting for the 11111 Jefferson project. Uh, while things are starting to reopen and everyday life is starting to get back to normal, in the interest of everyone's health and safety, we are still holding these uh, meetings virtually via Zoom. So with that in mind, we really appreciate your patience and understanding. Uh, in the event that we face any technical difficulties or if we have any connection issues, please bear with us uh, as we try and get them fixed. So as a quick uh, introduction on this call, you're going to hear from uh, Jackie Braver with the John Buck Company as well as myself, Kyle Faulkner with 3MR Capital, and together our companies are joint venturing on the 11111 Jefferson project. So we're going to walk you through the latest images and status of the project. And once we've completed our presentation, we'll open up uh, for community questions and comments. Uh, after an hour, we will end our presentation and we'll turn it over to the city's environmental consultant for their presentation. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zoom, uh, you have two different methods to ask questions tonight. Uh, you can either raise your hand or type a question into the Q&A section. In the interest of time, you can start typing in your uh, questions at any point in the presentation, uh, which should help us facilitate more questions and get you more responses. So if you raise your hand, we'll likely first work through the Q&A questions and then uh, we'll go through the list and, and call on people and allow people 60 seconds to ask their questions. Uh, I will ask that if you have any more technical questions related to the environmental report that you defer them to the second half of the meeting with the city's environmental consultant. So let's get started with the timeline that we've shown at just about all of our meetings. Uh, we are currently at the third formal, uh, fifth actual, and what we believe will be the final community meeting of the entitlement process. As you are hopefully aware, uh, the city's environmental uh, consultant published the draft environmental report for public comment and review on May 6th. If you have not seen this report, uh, it is available on the city's website and we will also be linking to it directly from our website. Uh, this release of the report kicked off a 45 day comment period which will end on June 21st. Uh, upon completion of the comment period, the city's environmental consultant ESA will formally respond to the comments that are received and publish the final environmental impact report document. Uh, upon completion of the report, the project will likely go to uh, before a planning commission for a hearing probably sometime in July or August, uh, and they will then provide a recommendation to city council for the project. There would then be a city council hearing approximately 30 to 45 days after that, depending on scheduling. Uh, and I do wanna point out that this meeting is not your last opportunity for comment. Uh, you will be able to voice any comments, questions, or concerns uh, at both the Planning Commission and City Council hearings. Uh, if the project were to be approved, uh, we would anticipate that construction on the project uh, would likely begin sometime in the second or third quarter of 2022. So I wanna take a step back to focus on where this project started uh, when we first presented our plan to you in August of 2019. Uh, at that meeting, we introduced the project team and laid out uh, our goals and vision for the site. We wanted to create a more consistent architectural and landscaping connection between the local communities and the site. We felt that this location had the opportunity to be a gateway project to connect Southern Culver City with the adjacent neighborhoods. We wanted to create a project that benefits the community and creates a point to come together with new gathering spaces that invite you in with permeable walkable design. We wanted this place to create new experiences, both active and passive, intimate and shared, and to allow everyone their own unique experiences within the project. We presented initial pass at the design, which included 279 residential units, 55,000 square feet of retail and 51,000 square feet of office space. We heard a lot at that meeting. People voiced their concerns about traffic on the corridor, about the size of the project and helped share their desires for this, for this site and the entire Sepulveda and Jefferson corridor. Since that meeting, since that initial meeting, we've held three additional large format meetings focused on traffic and mobility improvements, design aesthetics, and scoping for the environmental review process. 
In addition to these three large meetings, we've had over 40 smaller meetings with individuals and local communities to help craft the project we're presenting today and to help respond to inv individual concerns and questions. Today's revised plan includes 230 apartments, a decrease of approximately 15 to 20% from our initial vision. This reduction was in direct response to the community's feedback and request to decrease the massing and scale of the building. This decrease allowed us to significantly increase the setbacks of the project from the local residential neighborhoods, and it has allowed us to create a unique design with, signif with significantly more landscaping and tiered green spaces. We understand the community's concerns about traffic along the corridor, especially regarding peak hour trips along Sepulveda and Jefferson. In response to this concern, we've reduced the office component by approximately 80%, one of the largest contributors of peak hour trips within the project and changed our focus from creative and tech tenants to local community serving professional office space. Because of community feedback, we have significantly increased the size of the landscaped areas and relocated them within the project. What started as a 3000 square foot pocket park on Machado has been increased to nearly a third of an acre, almost five times its original size. The Paseo Park has almost doubled in size and been moved internally to create a sheltered outdoor living room experience. This is public space for the benefit of the community, directly accessible to community members. Our initial building plan, which I'm showing on the screen, included structures flanking the entire road along Machado and Jefferson, with a significant presence on Sepulveda. The building design was simpler. In fact, it looked a lot like the building on the corner of Overland and Washington, which we heard specifically from the community that they did not want in their backyard. Following this first community meeting, we spent a significant amount of time with our design team brainstorming on how to resolve and how to respond to some of the community concerns on building layout and design. And we held a design charrette to gather more individual feedback regarding what specifically people wanted to see. And I will turn it over to Jackie Braver with the John Buck Company to take over and speak a little more uh, to the design changes in that process. Thank you, Kyle. Um, my name is Jacqueline Braver. I'm with John Buck Company, one of the development team members. Um, so calling back to our initial vision, um, our goal was to have ongoing dialogues with both the community and city to inform the project's design. We wanted the design themes to evolve not solely on its uses and site planning, which are more technical in nature, but on how human engagement, smart urban design, commercial space vitality, all contribute and contextually relate to the surrounding, its residents and visitors alike. We recognize a sense of responsibility for the site's potential to contribute to the quality of life for the surrounding neighborhoods, as well as act as a gateway to the west end of Culver City. We wanted to set a high bar for future smart urban design and vitality along this commercial corridor. The input gathered from over two years, um, almost two and a half years of conversations with the city and the community generally fell within four overarching themes. Uh, the first was gateway architecture, create a sense of arrival uh, to a special place that connects the community. Secondly, diminish the development's sense of scale and mass and its relationship to its context. The third, design a strong sense of connectivity of many parts to a whole and spread programming across the site. The fourth, create a human scale amenity emphasizing strong visible and experiential connection. We spent over a year studying how to break up the site into many separate but interrelated experiences. Buildings are best situated when they can connect to the urban fabric, meeting the property line to where human engagement is at its strongest. Making the design porous helped connect the development to those whom it would serve. Designers looked at ways to break up the massing yet gracefully thread all disparate parts into one seamless vision and theme. Um, next slide, please. This internal brainstorming with our design team as well as the breakout community meetings shaped the project's objective to elevate a traditional mixed use car centric development into a cultural oasis reflecting Culver City's welcoming, lively and sustainable identity. We set out to create active community gathering areas with a dramatic and inviting destination for people to live, shop, dine, work, relax and engage with one another amidst landscape plazas, parks, and sheltered courtyards. Achieving this required a bold but sophisticated design that overcomes three fixed aspects of the site. It's very difficult triangular site plan to program, it's expansive frontages, it's adjacency to two significant thoroughfares. In order to soften the impression of the development while creating an inviting human experience, we approached the design from two perspectives, the street level experience and the upper level massing and articulation. Next slide, please. 
We begin at the corner of Sepulveda and Jefferson, uh, where we designed inviting public open space and green terraces to transform the site edge from a hard boundary into a soft, inviting, and lush collection of lively urban spaces. We extended this language into the upper level program and identity as an organic theme gradually ascends the building. The ground level design concept focuses on strong retail visibility and viability while punctuating each frontage with generous and protected usable public open spaces. The development's facade design follows an architectural language of rhythm and thematic connectivity from top down and across the entire site. This undulating rhythm anchors a floating three-story building atop a re retail base and connection to the public realm. Above the two commercial levels, an undulating residential building meanders across the site, providing large expanses of contextual massing relief, especially along and at the end of the north end of Machado Road. Residential building massing is further softened by one and two-story bay windows, bay, bal or, um, bay window clusters, and recessed balconies that punctuate the facade. Parapet recesses at the upper level balconies combined with undulating massing softens the building's profile and diminishes its scale or its impression of scale. Next slide, please. The architecture across the site shifts in hierarchy, building on a theme of diminishing scale. In this slide, the project's main entrance at Sepulveda and Janusan and the market come, come to the fore, while the residential massing on levels three to five recesses behind into the background. Understanding the community's concern with scale, we and our design team studied solutions that break up the building's massing, not only horizontally, but vertically. Several vertical breaks in the building massing further diminish the development scale and continuity into many unique parts. This allows the building architecture to have rhythm while anchoring itself to the human scale and engagement it's visioned to. Next slide, please. So most notably, we arrive at the project with two public serving park-like areas. Um, at Jefferson and Sepulveda, overhanging residential levels and street level landscape berms create a dynamic retail facing plaza that leads into an inviting paseo and tranquil interior atrium courtyard. Retail shops and green terraces ring this courtyard that opens to the sky. At Machado and Sepulveda, which is on the screen currently, a lush multi-use open space addresses the surrounding residential neighborhoods, complete with amphitheater seating and space for pop-up kiosks or other programming strongly desired by the community. On next slide, we wrap around the building um, along Machado Road. Um, I believe there's a slide that precedes this. Yes, this one. Thank you. Um, along Machado Road, the residential building, residential underground parking entrance, second level parking deck, secondary retail and grocery entry and delivery areas are all well concealed within a generous setback and landscape buffer and sound barriers to preserve the tranquility of the adjacent quieter residential neighborhoods. A consistent architectural theme of step terraces continues and is the primary building massing theme on the site's less commercial frontage. Identif identi indentation, excuse me, of the residential snake-like building form up above peels back from the street edge while significant greening and unique building materials come to the foreground. On the next slide, at Machado and Jefferson corner, the building strongly marks a major commercial corner. Its residential structure on floors three and five float atop a two building two-story building foundation, concealing parking behind a vertical and permeable screen of color, but emphasizes tenant identity and retail signage visibility and helps anchor the overall structural structure to its foundation. We designed three, the next slide, uh, we designed three major landscape architectural uh, focal points into the project design. The next three slides um, are renderings of these three areas that we want to highlight have been very well um, curated and not yet completely programmed um, for the project, but really create these inviting warm open spaces to the public. A Paseo Park at the corner of Jefferson and Sepulveda here drawing activity toward, to, draws activity toward and into the project. A second public space is an inside vibrant retail anchored and naturally lit internal courtyard or Paseo in this slide. Lastly, we anchor the project with a third of an acre public park at the corner of Machado and Sepulveda. We conducted several meetings with the public to help inform design of these spaces, and we anticipate further discussions with the community um, to help us define what the programming will be within the Machado Park itself. 
All of our community conversations and design concepts contributed to the manifestation of what we see in the building's architecture and urban design today. With this design summary, we now transition into the details of the project's um, site and floor plan programming and layout. Uh, so I turn it back to you, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now that we've had the chance to walk you around the building and show you what it looks like, we wanna spend a little bit more time walking you through the floor plans of the project to discuss specific uses, areas, and access points. So what you're currently looking at on the screen is the ground floor of the property as if we are looking at it from a bird's eye view. Uh, you can see that you've got Sepulveda access to the commercial component of the project is located on Sepulveda and Janisan here. Uh, we are proposing a new traffic signal to allow for safer pedestrian crossings and safer site access. There is a secondary commercial entrance along the east side of Machado here with the primary residential access on the west side of Machado here. Uh, what you can't see here is that there is a subterranean level uh, of parking that uh, exclusively serves the residential component of the project as well as contains some overflow parking uh, for ECF located across the street. Here is the Machado Corner Park with the residential lobby here. Uh, here's the 38,600 square foot grocery store um, with whose loading will take place here. Uh, the trucks will turn into our site and then back into their loading dock here, uh, which in the movement and sound will be uh, protected with a, a soundproof wall located here. Uh, there's an additional 17,000 square feet of retail shops here which will primarily consist of uh, restaurants, uh, fast casual and sit down restaurants, daily needs retail and some fitness uses. Uh, and the 17,000 square feet of retail spills out into uh, the Paseo Park located here. Uh, as I mentioned before, grocery loading will occur here. There are additional loading areas located here. Uh, this is an inset off of the public right of way onto our street uh, or onto our site, excuse me, which will allow access for uh, FedEx, UPS, and post office deliveries, as well as move in. Uh, there's additional loading areas here uh, with access to residential lobbies uh, and the commercial component, and additional cutouts here that will help serve for trash pickup and uh, retail loading as well. There are 81 parking spaces on the ground floor, and now we're going to follow this ramp up to the second level. So we're now directly above the retail component of the site. Uh, and in the primary commercial parking field for the project with 230 additional parking spaces. Uh, there's also 11,450 square feet of office here, which is an 80% reduction from what we uh, showed in our initial plan. There's a significant amount of uh, vertical transportation allowing for direct uh, access to the lower levels of the project. You've got elevators here, 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 uh, as well as escalators and staircases throughout the project uh, to allow for direct access to uh, the ground level retail and the public park space. You can see this blue line above. Uh, this blue line represents the outline of the building above, which I'm now going to show to you. So we're now directly above the office floor where we are showing uh, three levels of residential space for a total of 230 units. Uh, you can see here where that building follows that blue line that I mentioned earlier uh, and is significantly more setback from our initial plan uh, from uh, the local residential neighborhoods. You may recall in our initial plans, we had the residential building going all the way out to the corner, covering the park. We've now pulled it back and that park is uh, completely daylit and exposed to natural light. You can also see here where we have cut a hole in the building to allow for natural light to come to the ground floor and to create that outdoor uh, living room experience. So as we stated in our uh, initial community meeting, we wanted to create a project that benefits the community and contributes to the local neighborhood's long-term goals and values. Uh, one of the most pronounced benefits to the community is this significant amount of publicly accessible park area. Almost 20% of the ground level of the site will become park and open space, uh, which is replacing what is largely used today as a surface parking lot and an oil change facility. We heard the concerns regarding accessing the site and the dangerous pedestrian cross crossings and the inability to ride a bike on the major boulevards. In response, we've created new pedestrian access points and crosswalks to allow for a safe and secure experience. We've also added bike lanes, which will safely connect this project and the adjacent neighborhoods to the Biona Creek bike path. We've made several contributions to neighborhood mobility measures, including but not limited to uh, providing significantly more short and long-term bike parking than is required by code. 
providing a new bike share station and improving bus access and infrastructure around the site. Uh, we're also providing 19 very low income units, which is the highest number of affordable units provided in a mixed income project uh, within Culver City in at least the last decade. So we understand that traffic and parking are primary concerns for local communities uh, along the Sepulveda and Jefferson corridors. Uh, we have worked to improve the flow of traffic around the site by eliminating the street parking and significantly reducing the number of curb cuts on the site from 10 down to three. This has allowed us to help distribute traffic around the site in a manner that helps work with and better the flow of traffic. We've improved signalization with new light timing and are working to implement smart systems that would better react to changing traffic conditions along the corridor. We've pushed to maintain uh, our above required parking counts to help ensure that shoppers and residents do not park in adjacent communities. We are also exploring additional measures to help prevent cut through traffic, such as implementing new signage programs uh, and making various street level improvements. We are also in the process of implementing a detailed transportation demand management plan or TDM plan, which will include multiple mobility measures. Some of these include pushing benefits for those who commute to the site and increasing accessibility to and education for transportation options around the project. Uh, we are creating a mobility hub with information and access to other mobility options, uh, including a metro or bike share station, uh, access to electronic bicycles, implementing a car share program, and providing access to transit subsidies for residents of the project. I will say that the TDM plan is still a work in progress, so if you have any additional ideas or comments about what may or should be included in this, uh, we would love to get additional feedback on those items. Uh, and in, on the note of getting more feedback uh, and comments, I think now would be a good time to end the presentation uh, and open up the floor for your questions. So I'm going to turn this over to Eric Shapsis, uh, who's going to help monitor and moderate any of the comments that come in through the Q&A. Uh, and I believe he and the technical team will also help call on people who raise their hand to speak uh, if time allows. So Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, Kyle. And thank you again, everyone, for your participation um, in this meeting. Um, several folks have already uh, written some, drafted some questions in the Q&A box, which I will go through first and read and uh, provide, uh, and our team will provide some uh, answers to those. I will then go to, I will then call upon anyone who has their hands uh, raised and um, our technical team will be able to un mute you so that you can ask your question um, or provide a comment uh, in the interest of time and to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We will be providing one minute for written comment, excuse me, for oral comments. Anyone who would like to provide a second comment may do so after we've gone through and heard from uh, anyone if time is permitting. So the first question is from Dr. Tom Williams. How many truck loads of dirt excavated will be loaded and taken from the site? How deep is maximum and general excavation? Were the, will there be any pilings or stone pile caissons? I believe that question we will uh, save for the EIR portion of the meeting as those appear to be uh, EIR related questions. So we'll, we'll save those. Yeah, the only thing that I would expand on that, thanks, Eric, if you can hear me okay, is that um, most of the questions that are being posed in that specific tr um, tranche are related to the construction data needs that we had to gather from our consultants to inform the EIR analysis, the civil engineering EIR analysis. So yes, that's a, a good place for those questions to um, reside. Um, there was, uh, excuse me, there's another question that was um, less EIR in nature and more open, um, and that's related to the caissons or the structure. Um, we are not doing caissons per se, but the structure of this, um, of this development is rammed aggregate piers. So it's actually soil injected um, or a, a cementitious product injected into the soil to strengthen it. And then we will have piers developed on top of that with concrete decks um, from a subterranean deck up to level uh, three. 
So I hope that answers your question, but if you have a more specific structural engineering question, I'm happy to answer that for you. Um, uh, we can take your information. Thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Arthur Casson. For the retail component, the only truck loading areas are for the market. Where will trucks for the other businesses load? Many will be 28 feet or 30 feet or longer and will not fit into parking spaces. Uh, sure, I can, I can go ahead and answer that. Um, I believe I pointed them out on the site plan as we were going through. We're actually targeting three or four additional areas for potential truck loading. And that includes one on Sepulveda, one on Jefferson, uh, and one internally to our project on Machado, which should be able to fit um, these 28 to 30 foot long uh, lo or longer trucks, um, as well as we will be providing modified hours for uh, loading in the parking spaces in front of the retail component for the trucks that do fit uh, within that category. And one other thing, you know, Kyle, on, on um, those areas on Sepulveda and on Jefferson, um, I believe that they would be occasionally using the indentations that we have taken out of the right of way of the street, and we've actually encroached into the um, project uh, boundaries itself for an additional lane to address residential loading and some of the queuing that we would have for trash pickup and retail loading and residential loading. So we have, uh, I don't know if we could call that back up on screen, but there are specific off, off street areas within the project site dedicated to those um, functions. Question from Kimberly Ferguson. Why do you only state that you will build, quote, up to 19 affordable low income units? Why? Why do you not have an, at least a 20% low income housing? Are you aware of the state law AB 2345? If a development provides 24% 24, 24 low income housing house, the development will receive a 50% bonus against the development costs. Sure. So I am not aware of state law AB 2345. Uh, so I apologize. I, I can't really speak to that. Uh, we are building uh, an affordable component that we are proud of at 19 very low income units, which are at uh, 50% of 30 to 50% of median area income, which I believe I stated before. I, I think it is the, the most um, for, uh permitted or, or built during uh, as part of a mixed income project in the last decade in, in Culver City. So we are building to a level at or above uh, compliance with uh, SB 1818, which is the state density law that, that we are following. Kyle, um, I can add a little bit more detail to that and respond to the question directly. I'm Elisa Pastor, I'm the Chief Counsel for the project. Um, at the time that we conceived of the project, AB 2345 was not in place, and the maximum density bonus at that time was 35%. And um, we are providing the requisite number of affordable units that we need for the density bonus that we're specifically requiring for this project. So we, we're not asking for a 50% density bonus. Arthur Casson asks another question. The residential component will have many truck deliveries, UPS, FedEx, Amazon, as residents shop online. Where will those trucks park? Where will the post office trucks delivering to the residences park? So if you could bear with me, I'm gonna pull this presentation back up here. So hopefully you can see my screen. Um, at this point, there are a few different locations that we are targeting. Uh, again, as Jackie alluded to, this is an area here where we are going to allow for UPS, FedEx, uh, postal trucks. Uh, as she mentioned, this is not part of the public right-of-way. This indent here is, I believe, more than uh, 11 and a half to 12 feet to allow for significant, significant truck widths that would be outside of the public right-of-way. This is on our site. Uh, so we are targeting this location here. Uh, there may also be opportunities to park below um, uh, for smaller vans or, or smaller trucks that would fit into the below grade component. Kimberly Ferguson. The below grade um, residential parking, right? Correct. 
Kimberly Ferguson asks, are you aware that- Sorry, we also are... had one of the- Sorry, Eric, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, Kimberly Ferguson asks, are you aware that we already have a surplus of commercial real estate office properties available and vacant in our city? The complex at Washington and Culver still has an almost entirely vacant first floor to its office space. Um, I, I believe the complex that she's referring to, it, Washington and Culver come together and there's no complex there. Um, I believe what she's referring to is actually in the city of Los Angeles, what we know as Cobalt on the corner of Washington and over. Sure. So uh, the retail component of the project, uh, the commercial is, is about 55,000 square feet of which 38,600 <clears throat> square feet or about 70% of it uh, is already spoken for in the form of a grocery store. So that leaves about 17,000 square feet, which we are anticipating breaking into about five to seven tenants. So realistically, there isn't a lot of space left to fill, but we have had several conversations with retail tenants who want to be in this market, but have not found a location suitable for them. That's not to say that there isn't vacancy uh, and available spaces within the market, but those spaces don't fulfill what these tenants are looking to accomplish uh, in the way of patios and gathering spaces. I, I think everyone understands that the retail is changing and retail is continuing to change during and, and after COVID and we will continue to watch that. Um, but we, we know that what retailers are looking for in terms of access to experiences, patios and, and outdoor gathering areas uh, doesn't really exist in most parts of uh, Southern Culver City and, and the tenants who've wanted to be here have not found a location that works for what they're looking for. So we've had numerous conversations with fast casual restaurants and we've spoken to four different coffee concepts who all are looking to be in this market. So we are very optimistic and, and pleased with the conversations um, we've had so far about filling the, the, the retail space within the project. Kimberly Ferguson also asks, will you replace the bus metro stops closer to the corner where you will be displacing the one bus stop that currently exists there. Uh, yes, we are replacing and moving two bus stops with, bear with me again as I pull my screen back up. Uh, there is currently a bus stop here, which we will be moving closer to this corner here. There is also a bus stop around this area which will be moving down here. So we are uh, removing and replacing the two existing bus stops, correct? So one other thing I would expand on about the bus stops is that there's been um, a lot of significant amount of coordination with the transportation and traffic and planning departments, um, as well as even trash management and EPO, public works, to locate these uh, bus stops in the most appropriate locations. So um, it, this is not a, a choice of ours, but has been um, an in-depth collaboration with the city to inform their locations. Um, Arthur Casson again, as people move in and out of the residential component, where will the moving vans park without blocking traffic lanes on Sepulveda and Jefferson? Uh, so I think this is very consistent uh, with the train of um, conversation we were having earlier regarding these cutout areas that we've designed uh, that are off the public right of way to allow for these uh, this loading to occur. Mm -hmm. That's here. As well uh, as Jefferson. there's a Jefferson spot as well. Yeah. Kimberly Ferguson asks, mm -hmm. how will you provide better car and foot access to the concept and residential areas? Um, may I ask for an elaboration of when we say concept, um, I'm not sure what she means, but the, the residential area, I, I, if I can, and let me know if I'm not answering this question in the manner in which you were hoping for, but, um, there with the, with the project site planning and the distribution of uses across the entire site, we've created a lot of, um, what we would call permeability or the ability for humans through, you know, pedestrian through walking or bicycle or vehicular in nature, that there's many access points and ways in which you can engage with 
and enter the project. Um, the residential lobby and leasing office is all the way at the northern corner. And Kyle, you may have control of the screen that you can highlight where that location is. And it's immediately adjacent to the public park. Um, with all the retail spaces, they're all front loaded to the stronger commercial corridor and corner of Sepulveda and Jefferson, which has direct pedestrian connection. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that we really wanted um, this project to be with a three and a half acre site, which is challenging is most developments are just a, a residential, a, excuse me, a rectangular building that's up against the property line and really stands a front to the community versus engages the community and tries to draw people in. And so that was really our intention. There are many, many points of access and ingress and egress, if you will, um, from a walkability perspective in and out of the project. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams asks, what is the current land property ownerships, Prop 13 owners and CC public property ownerships? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question. Are they asking? I think, the I think Dr. Owns? Williams is asking who owns, who currently owns the property and okay. what type of ownership that is. There's two separate owners and we are in uh, contract to purchase the land with both of them. Uh, I believe ECF owns this parcel up here on the screen that I'm trying to highlight uh, and uh, individual family owns the other three parcels. Um, Arthur Casson again, um, guest parking for the residential component is at one quarter the city's requirement. Why wasn't the city standard used? Where will overflow guest parking take place? Janice Ann, the shopping center across Jefferson. So um, we are consistent with the guidelines under SB 1818. Uh, for guest parking, and we are providing uh, 14 guest parking spaces above what we are required to, to provide. Uh, we did not run a shared parking analysis with the effort to uh, reduce the allowable parking on our site, and we are overparked um, on the commercial component. We've, we've really worked hard to make sure that we have a, a balance of uses that kind of park throughout the day. Um, I would say a lot of guest parking is, is later at night when the coffee concepts won't really be parking um, or grocery stores may be closed. We're also allowing for additional areas on the second floor. You can see here we have a, a residential lobby, um, a residential elevator here that would also provide access into uh, the residential component in the event that uh, guests, um, guest parking occurred in this area. Um, the, other, the other elevators that are residential would also work um, across the entire site. So we have one on Jefferson and one also at the upper left-hand corner uh, where the residential lobby and leasing office are, or directly above. Mm -hmm. um, while we're on a uh, question uh, regarding parking, Mark Bauer um, and uh, Mr. Bauer, please put your questions in the Q&A section, not the chat section, but um, Mark Bauer asked, what is ECF overflow parking? Uh, so ECF overflow might have been a, a misnomer. Um, what I mean is it is a replacement for the existing parking spaces that are currently on the site. So in regards to uh, employee parking or whatever parking demands they might have, uh, they have access to the below ground parking structure, 34 parking spaces. Um, Kimberly Ferguson, uh, I believe you should have at least one more public hearing. The entire city residents are affected by this development and you have not notified us all equally. Why don't you send email the government list to inform us all and also print a letter for another hearing in both local papers? Um, I, uh, I can take, uh, I can take that. Um, I believe that this, uh, that this hearing actually was, um, provided for by the city's, uh, list serve, 
um, and was blasted out um, by the city of Culver City to um, all residents who have signed up to receive such. Um, we, over the last two years, as we've gone out and had more meetings than required and over 40 uh, meetings, including three uh, public community meetings, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the third that is actually required and the number that is required by the city. Um, we've had two additional uh, large community-wide meetings as well, and um, over 30 uh, neighborhood and residential community meetings. So we have kept uh, abreast of, um, we've kept the neighbors and the community abreast of this project and we'll continue to do so. Um, we've, we've created our own list of uh, well over a couple of hundred email addresses and additional um, uh, addresses to whom we notify uh, and to whom we've notified uh, of this meeting and the subsequent meetings as uh, Kyle indicated will be at the planning commission and the um, city council and will be appropriately noticed. Um, uh, Robin Turner uh, writes, this project is way too large and dense for this area and will destroy the ambience and quality of life of the residents. The project does not benefit the residents and still violates the height initiative ordinance. Why do developers get benefits and make money when the residents suffer and have to deal with this horrible project forever? Once the project goes up, the area around it will also be able to develop to this density, such as the Pier 1 Pavilion. So how do you work the traffic and other planning issues with this situation in mind? Yes, I, I what I would um, what I would contribute to this is um, it's a it's we understand that this is a multifaceted um, problem. We've had this exact same dialogue with the community for two and a half years, and it's um, it's challenging to see a, d a development of a size that is new to the area happen and we recognize that there are challenges in that regard definitely um there's an extremely strong need as we all know across california for more housing in fact there was a very strong ask for more density at this site and by strong community sentiment uh, we actually did scale down the project um, in the number of residential units in a significant amount of reduction of office space, um, significant amount of building area, paired it back from the corner of Sepulveda and Machado. So there are a lot of very, um, you know, specific and large scale reductions to the project that had occurred through the last two and a half years of community engagement. Um, the one thing I would say about um, thoughtful urban design and planning is that a lot of the surrounding land uses that are not related to single family developments are, you know, very large um, asphalt parking lots um, that serve a lot of big box retail, some of which are no longer viable. So there's a change in land use patterns and, and things that are happening in the community that this project is very forward thinking in and has um, offered a great deal of collaboration on many levels with the city and very thoughtful planners and engineers and designers to look at the way in which we can create a very thoughtful, beautiful space for the community to use and engage and access. So um, I think uh, I think it's a, a culmination of a lot of um, things that people feel good about, um, but it is it certainly cannot be denied that land use patterns are going to change in the area from small strip malls and parking lots to um, places where people can live and work and eat and gather and commune. So um, hopefully that's headed in a positive direction for Culver City and many other cities across California. Uh, Sherry Barrett uh, writes, how will you keep the homeless from moving in and taking over the park areas? and?" Uh, and that about security since the other malls in our Culver City area are being overwhelmed by crime. I'll, I'll take that, Eric, thank you. It's uh, Dominic Aducci from the John Buck Company. We, we have a, a rather sophisticated and explicitly described in the EIR security program to address this sort of concern. 
It includes uh, a, a technological a solution, lots of video cameras, 24-hour uh, surveillance, roving security personnel on site for 24 hours a day. So there's a, a very active and uh, a, a aggressive program that will do everything within the management company's power to secure the site. If, if I can um, expand on what Dominic shared too, is that from a design perspective, um, the nice thing is that the public park at Sepulveda and Machado, we actually um, designed a residential leasing and lobby office, which is the primary residential entrance to have a, uh, a, a very strongly fenestrated or glass area box that faces the park so that the visibility of property management and security and leasing staff and the residences themselves have a direct line site to this entire park area to help prevent that from happening. That's above and beyond um, the security, which would provide maybe a more active role in that regard. And in the other public space that's at the corner of Sepulveda and Machado or Sepulveda and Jefferson, excuse me, that's much more retail focused or community and active activated space. There's a lot of, there's so much activity there with all the retailers facing that Pacific and courtyard that there's again so much line sight um, and monitoring that's going to naturally happen through the design that we created. So I think those two things in concert with each other are going to really help reduce those issues. Um, Jeff Lintz, very pretty project, but respectfully, it looks like another five to six story development, albeit with pretty things like small gardens sprinkled through it. The size is what a number of us don't like about the building on Washington and Overland. This one is its twin. Why must development always be uh, more than two to three stories tall? I suspect the answer is money. And this makes me sad because it is only a matter of time before both sides up and down Sepulveda Corridor will be large developments, not by small town corners. Uh, we appreciate your feedback and, and comment. We, we understand where, where you're coming from on this. Um, I will say that I believe the project on Washington Overland is, is six or seven stories. So we, we are below that. Um, uh, at the end of the day, there, there are a number of items that the height of the building allow us to help accommodate as such as 19 very low income uh, affordable units, um, almost 30,000 square feet of, of parks and open space as well as significant setbacks. So, what we were working to create here is a balance that helps uh, take into account some of the other concerns about the community and, and try and create a project that, while it might be a little bit taller than what's in the corridor now, um, helps to accommodate and create some new uh, unique experiences for the community. Kimberly Ferguson asks, how can we, we revise the EII to properly reflect the true potential environmental impact in categories <coughs> which currently need as without need of mitigation? These are too many to list here, so I would like to know how we discuss this in more detail. Again, I think that's um, directed at the EIR consultants, and so um, can we reserve that for the second half and be addressed by the city and its uh, environmental consultants? Uh, Debbie, Debbie Jeffries, what grocery store will there be? There's a pavilion across the street. Uh, sure, I can handle that one. Um, Unfortunately, at this point in time, we aren't able to say who the grocery store will be. Um, what I will say is that it is a unique offering to Culver City that is not currently in the market. Uh, they actually approached us with a strong desire to be in this location. Um, I wish I was able to share a name. Uh, I'm not able to, but once I am, I, I do think the community will be excited to have them. Uh, they are a different and unique offering from what is on the corridor now. Um, a little bit more focus on what we'd call prepared foods or that hot foods bar. So when you walk into the grocery store and you can make your own salad or make your own tacos for, for lunch, it's a little bit more, more of that uh, in addition to just groceries. So we are confident that they will fit well into the framework of the community um, and that they will provide a, a different offering from what is currently available on, on the corridor. <clears throat> uh, John Grass. Um, you have loading going on Jefferson Boulevard. That seems like a huge issue. How did that impact the traffic study? I don't believe it was spelled out at the time. 
So I will have to defer the traffic study questions to the second half of the meeting. Uh, we are contemplating loading on Jefferson Boulevard. Uh, my understanding of the loading here is that it would be uh, one, one of the items would be trash pickup, which is, is, which is its primary focus. Uh, the other would be for kind of single or, or one-time loading um, opportunities. So kind of maybe early in, in the moving process uh, when retail tenants don't have uh, the ability to front load their store uh, and it would be likely monitored. So it's not during peak hours. We would restrict the loading times uh, and manage that with on-site management to make sure it doesn't uh, impact the right of way. And again, it, it is uh, wide enough uh, at, I believe, 11 and a half or, or 12 feet to be able to fit the entirety of the truck, uh, trash truck or loading truck outside of the, the public right of way. Um, will the bike path be protected or simply painted? Uh, I believe it will be painted, but that is still in development and discussion with the city. Um, Kathy Penzo, will there be any low-income units? So yes, there will be 19 uh, very low-income units, and that is uh, very low-income means <clears throat> at a rate of 30 to 50 percent of area median income. Kimberly Ferguson asks, can you consider a restaurant uh, much like the family-style coffee shop, which Coco's, which is which was an essential community meeting place? Absolutely. Uh, we're still in the process of putting together our merchandising plan for what types of tenants and where we want them. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to have about five to seven additional retail tenants above and beyond uh, the grocery store. But our goal is to have a balance of offerings um, that help distribute vehicle trips throughout the day. Uh, for example, our goal will be to have a sit-down restaurant that may be busier in the evening, as well as a coffee shop that might be busier in, in, the, uh, in the morning time. But our goal is to create places that will serve the community and to have offerings you can go to once a week rather than once a year. I just want to note that uh, we have about 40 open questions and about seven minutes, so we do need to get through these uh, quickly, if um, we do not respond to your questions, um, we will attempt to find an email address for you and respond uh, to your questions, um, or you may reach out to us through the website as well. Um, Brian Sowell, will parking be free for commercial lots and employees so people don't park in neighborhoods to avoid, to avoid parking fees? The answer is yes. Uh, I, I will say that there is one uh, mitigation measure, which I believe ESA and, and um, the city's environmental consultant will speak to a little bit more on the uh, office parking, but there, there will, uh, to echo Dominic's point, there will absolutely be no uh, charge for, for the retail parking at the project. Uh, Carolyn Strauss, what are the blue areas in the layout? Um, Carolyn also asks, are the living units condos or apartments? Um, they're, they're apartments, not condos. So this will be a, a multifamily rental apartment project, both in the market rate units as well as the affordable units. I'm sorry, could you repeat the first question? Before I the think the blue, question? she was asking what the blue areas were, and I believe that indicated where the second floor commercial space was, if I'm not mistaken. There are also the blue areas on the ground floor, which refer to uh, bike parking areas as well. Um, uh, Kin Kin G uh, asked, it appears that the number six bus stop on Sepulveda and the number four bus stop on Jefferson have disappeared. What is their fate? I think you've pointed out that both of those bus stops remain there just being moved in coordination with the city transportation department to uh, uh, slightly different locations along um, both Sepulveda and Jefferson respectively. Uh, Carolyn Strauss asks, why are they considering a supermarket for the site? Um, again, I believe that has been uh, responded to um, in a previous question. Is our, in our small meeting, the issue of broadband infrastructure was raised. Did you make any progress um, seeing if you could make a deal to bring fiber to the area since Spectrum is already struggling to keep up? Uh, we did have some conversations uh, related to fiber in the area. 
Um, Eric, I might need your help on that one. I can't. Yes, remember. we talked to the we talked to the Chamber of Commerce, and the city is providing fiber in the area. And um, Brian, we will circle back with you with the information that we've um, received. Um, Natalie Stanger, what do you mean by eliminating pass through traffic? Is that a way to prevent people traveling on Sepulveda to turn on Machado to get to the shopping center? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question. We are not preventing anyone on some Sepulveda uh, traveling in either direction from going uh, onto Machado Road. So that would still be a, a movement if you wanted to, to go north on, on Sepulveda turn or southbound and, and turn on, you'd still be able to make that movement. So I, I apologize for not fully understanding your question. Vicki Foxworth, we live on Janice Ann. Can we get speed bumps in additional to community parking zone. Um, Vicki, um, we would very much like to continue to have conversations with uh, residents along the Genesis Ann corridor. And so um, we will reach out to you so that we can schedule a uh, small format meeting with residents along Genesis Ann um, and Kayleen. Marla. And to add to that really quickly is that uh, I believe the city's traffic study has specifically requested that um, they reserve the right to monitor volumes and, and traffic along that and, and request that we put in uh, speed bumps um, further along in the project. Marla Kuset, um, I spend time in the area, this area and use these roads often. My concern is that traffic level around the corner of Sepulveda and Jefferson is really congested, especially before COVID. I cannot imagine the amount of density that is planned for this lot. It's mainly the amount of cars and congestion that this project that a project like this is going to bring to this area. Thank you for your um, for your comment. Um, did you say there will be an entrance for the public on uh, Jefferson? No, there will not be an entrance on on Jefferson. There will not be a vehicular entrance on Jefferson. Correct. Yes, there, there is a walking entrance on Jefferson. Um, Kin Kin G, according to AB 2345, you can get up to 50% density bonus if you provide 24% low-income housing units. Would you be willing to increase the number of low-income housing units that you can build? Um, uh, Ms. G, or Dr. G, that um, question has already been answered. This uh, project is uh, engaged um, SB 1818, 35% uh, density bonus and is in compliance with that. Uh, AB 2345 was not available at the time the project was conceived. Um, Leslie Abel, do you anticipate that traffic on Machado will be limited in ways during the construction and what will be the hours and days of construction? The hours and days of construction have been um, specified in the construction data needs that informed the EIR process. So I don't have those um, that information off the top of my head, but we are also um, required to put together in response to um, final comments in the planning entitlements, um, a uh, draft construction management plan. So that document will also um, highlight the, con the proposed construction hours. Um, as well as the EIR document itself. Um, so I might defer to the EIR conversation later, but that technical information not be, may not be readily available. So um, please feel free to reach out to us separately and we can obtain that information for you. Dr. Williams, parking and affordable issues not shown in Q&A. Is there another route for Q&A? How about property ownership? Uh, I'm not um, understanding that question, um, Dr. Williams. I, again, I think, um, Dr. Williams, I think many of your questions that you're trying to uh, um, provide are for the second half of this meeting, which will begin in a minute uh, on the EIR. Um, Bonnie Wacker, the Jefferson Boulevard facade has limited green space and trees. Can you add double the amount of trees there and planting beds as well as climbing vines up the walls and layered planting to soften the five story uh, canyon feel? Um, Bonnie, I think, uh, um, well, we will continue to work with you on this issue. I know that um, you and Rupesh uh, as well as uh, Kyle 
um, continue to have dialogue and, and, and we'll continue to circle back directly with you, Bonnie, on yeah. um, your great, great ideas. And, and so Eric, I, I have one comment to add. I think, I think we're at our time limit, but uh, I think this is the most important comment to make for the meeting is that I, I personally just want to thank everyone from Studio Village, from Sunkiss Park, Lindbergh Park. We had many meetings, 30 plus meetings over the last year and a half, two years. And, and the community has a lot of great people. It's been a great, I have, I've had so many laughs with people and a fun time just having conversations and I'm, I've got to meet some great people. So I'm very thankful for everything that you've, you've given us, input, feedback, thoughts, insight, and just truly thank you for, for your time. So. I would like to, to second that, that piece. Um, I think this is the moment where we will transition into uh, the city's uh, environmental um, presentation. Uh, I know there's still 25 answers here um, or questions here, excuse me. Uh, Eric, I think we have a lot of this contact information here, so I think we can respond. Um, anything else? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking, um, I'm just uh, looking very quickly um, if there's anything uh, very quickly that um, we can answer. Again, um, Dr. Williams, um, I believe that the questions you are asking and the responses that you are asking um, are those that are part of the EIR and any questions that are uh, provided as part of the EIR uh, to the city and the city's consultants will be responded to um, as part of the final EIR. And I believe you should be forwarding those questions uh, in that format uh, when, when we end this portion of uh, the project, uh, th this portion of the presentation. Um, again, very quickly, um, I'm just looking uh, oh, in response to uh, Seth, we will have dedicated rideshare parking and waiting areas within the project, uh, as well as drop off areas. So uh, within that second floor, we'll likely dedicate some areas for waiting um, and for uh, immediate pickup and delivery of food. Um, so we, we will work to address um, rideshare services within the project and within specific areas. And Carolyn Strauss um, asks about an architect there are two architects that have been long selected. One is a local Culver City architecture firm, Y Architecture, um, as the design architect. And then there's uh, AO um, uh, as another architect that has been part of the design of this project. Um, uh, uh, Carolyn Strauss, um, where will the post office go? Um, at this time, um, uh, the post office has said that they will be relocating separate and apart from this project, but we have not heard as to their exact location. Um, Erica, uh, someone... I, believe, I believe that we do need to transition to yeah. the ER yep. meeting now. So, um, but let's uh, make sure to take note of all of the remaining questions. So we'll make sure that they get answered with everybody individually. Thank you so much for everybody's time and participation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.